The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. In the 11th chapter of the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah paints us a beautiful picture of the coming Messiah and of the eternal reign of the Messiah. And he writes these words, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. This shoot, this righteous branch, will do what is right. Isaiah writes, Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. And it will be a time of peace, a time of security. Again, Isaiah writes, The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and the little child shall lead them. It's a beautiful picture of of the reign of the Messiah and what we have to look forward to as believers after this life when God takes us to be with Him. That's the 11th chapter of Isaiah. Then in the 12th chapter of Isaiah, he describes how the people of God will respond to the wonderful salvation that they have received. The first six verses of Isaiah 12 make up the Old Testament text that we consider this morning. And we read, You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Here ends the Old Testament text. And let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Dear fellow redeemed, today as we consider these words of the prophet Isaiah, we realize that these words are our words as well. We say with Isaiah, God is my salvation. Though you were angry with me, your anger turned away. Why was God angry with us? Well, first of all, we keep in mind that God is never angry without cause. When God is angry, he has every right to be angry. Often we describe the anger of God by using the term wrath, the wrath of God. That's his just and righteous anger over the sinfulness of all who have rebelled against him. So God was angry with us because we earned his anger. We sinned against him. We disobeyed him. Like the prodigal son, we accepted his earthly blessings and then ran from him, seeking happiness in all the wrong places. We were unwilling to live under all the rules and restrictions that our Heavenly Father had placed on us. Our Heavenly Father commanded that we love Him above all things. We preferred, however, to put other things first. He would always be there when we needed Him, after all. So until we felt we needed Him, we chose to put husband or wife first, to put our money first, or our hobbies or our entertainment first. Our Heavenly Father commanded that we make time in our lives for hearing and learning His Word. We preferred, however, to find other uses for our time. His Word would always be there when we felt we needed it, after all, if we ever really needed it. Until we felt we needed God's Word, why not sleep in on Sunday? Why not spend all our free time watching TV or reading the newspaper? Our Heavenly Father commanded that we respect those in authority over us. 
However, we preferred to reserve the right to determine for ourselves whether or not those in authority were deserving of our respect and obedience. Why should we obey our leaders in government when they seem so corrupt and so out of touch with us? Our Heavenly Father commanded that we love our neighbor, that we help our neighbor in every need. However, we preferred to relax this command to the point where we felt we were doing a service to God so long as we didn't commit outright murder. We saw no harm in hating others so long as we kept those feelings to ourselves. We saw no real need to help others in need because that was their own problem. Our Heavenly Father committed, commanded that we not commit adultery. However, we preferred also to relax this command a little bit. Maybe we never became guilty of outright adultery in our actions, and yet we were perhaps a little loose in the things we allowed ourselves to watch on television or on the internet, perhaps loose in how we acted when the husband or the wife was not around. Our Heavenly Father commanded that we not steal, and we were fine with this as long as we were permitted to find ways to take possessions by technically legal means, technicalities, so long as we could stretch the truth a little on our tax forms, so long as we were permitted at least to envy the things that others have, to complain about the things that we would like to have and do not have. Our Heavenly Father commanded us not to give false witness, to use our tongues only to show love for one another, to build others up. But then we convinced ourselves that we're free to say whatever we want about someone else as long as he deserved it. just to name a few. Like teenagers finding loopholes in the rules, we try to give the appearance of obedience only to avoid losing privileges. We disrespected our loving Father. We rebelled against every command that He gave us for our own good. We are the prodigal son. We demanded our inheritance and moved out, eager to be on our own, eager to make our own rules. But eventually, young people realize how good they had it back home. They realize that self-sufficiency is not all that it was cracked up to be. Sooner or later, they even realize, whether or not they admit it, they realize that their parents knew what they were doing after all, that all those rules and discipline were for good reason, that all those rules and discipline were out of loving concern. The truth is, life without our Heavenly Father is hell. This is very literally true, because hell is simply separation from God. So when we run away from our Heavenly Father in this life, we cause ourselves great suffering. And yet we never fully experience the hell that we deserve here on earth. Because in this life, the Lord continues to send rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. Even though we may run from him, he continues to provide for us. After this life, however, all sinners face complete separation from God, complete separation from the providence of God forever. We cannot even begin to imagine how horrible our existence would be if we were fully cut off from God. The Lord had every reason to be angry with us, the Lord had every reason to give us the thing we demanded, to give us freedom from Him, to leave us alone, to abandon us forever. However, Isaiah writes, Though you were angry with me, your anger turned away. Why would the Lord turn away His anger from stubborn, spoiled children like us? Why would He ever forgive us? Why would He help us after we had taken our inheritance and run away forever. The Lord forgives unrighteous children like us for the sake of His one righteous child. Jesus Christ is the perfect Son. He obeyed every command of His heavenly Father. He respected and loved and honored His Father at all times. Now we know that loving parents must discipline their children, and children do not always understand at the time why this discipline is good for them. Jesus, however, 
as the perfect Son of God, never once questioned the wisdom of His Father, even when the Father led Him through great suffering. Jesus simply trusted and prayed, Your will be done. And in fact, God the Father disciplined Jesus, His Son, most severely, not for the good of Jesus, but for our good. He punished Jesus for our rebellion, for our disrespect, for our ungratefulness. He punished Jesus in our place so that the holy life that Jesus lived could be credited to each one of us. He regarded Jesus as the rebellious son so that he could regard us as his holy and faithful children. He rejected and abandoned Jesus so that he would never have to reject or to abandon us. And because the Lord has done all of this for us, we rejoice in those words of the prophet Isaiah. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. The Messiah has come. The Lord has redeemed spiritual Israel. The Father has welcomed home the prodigal son. His anger turned away through the atonement accomplished by Jesus Christ. And now that we are back home with our Heavenly Father, who loves us, He comforts us every day through the sweet message of salvation in Christ. So we continue to rejoice, saying, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and He has become my salvation. Think about what we mean when we say, God is my salvation. We mean we haven't done anything to save ourselves. Salvation comes to us only in Christ, only by the grace of God. As the prodigal son, none of us deserves to be welcomed back. But even so, the father forgives the prodigal son freely. Therefore, we also say, I will trust, because we rely fully on the Lord for salvation. We rely fully on the Lord for all good things, for all of our needs. And since our trust is in Him alone, we also may not be afraid. We are safe. We are secure in the house of our Father. We have nothing to fear anymore. We confess that the Lord God is my strength, because He has redeemed us by His power. He has won the battle for us. And he is my song. Because after all that he has done for us, he is and remains the object of our unending praise and thanks. The Lord has accomplished salvation for all people. He desires to welcome all of his lost children back into his loving arms. Not all people, however, receive this free salvation. The Lord brings His salvation to us through faith. And the Lord brings us to faith through repentance. What is repentance? Well, the prodigal son offers us an excellent example of true repentance when he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. No excuses, no demands. The son simply expresses his total unworthiness and his sorrow over his own failure. And so we gather here each week and we confess our sins, essentially saying, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And every week, and in fact every day of our lives, our gracious Father grants us His forgiveness and He renews us through His means of grace. When your pastor stands in front of you during worship and declares to you that all of your sins are forgiven in Christ, your Father is welcoming you home. When your pastor or even when any fellow Christian in a private setting reminds you that your sins are in fact forgiven in Christ. Your Father is welcoming you home. When you hear the Scriptures read during worship 
And then as you listen to a sermon based on one of those readings, your Father is welcoming you home when you sit in your recliner or at your kitchen table and read from your Bible. Your Father is welcoming you home. And when you approach the altar and for just a moment you step out of space and time and you join all believers in heaven and on earth in feasting on the body and blood of the Lamb who was slain for your sins, your Father is welcoming you home. And this is what Isaiah means when he writes, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. He means that whenever you return to the water of your baptism through confession and absolution, whenever you hear and learn the word of God, the word of the Lord, whenever you eat and drink the body and blood of your Savior, you are drawing life-giving water from the wells of salvation. Like a good Lutheran, I enjoy a well-crafted beer in the evening. And some of my favorite beers come from a brewery in England. It's called Samuel Smith's Old Brewery. It's currently owned by Humphrey and Oliver Smith. This brewery has been in operation since 1758. And it's been in the Smith family since 1847. So as you might expect, the owners of this brewery value tradition quite highly. And since they value tradition so highly, to this day, they maintain a small team of horses which they continue to use to deliver beer around town five days out of every week. In addition, Samuel Smith continues to brew beer using water that is drawn from the original well that was sunk in 1758. Can you imagine that? That means when I enjoy a glass of Samuel Smith's oatmeal stout, I'm drinking water that came from a well that was dug into the ground 258 years ago. Two and a half centuries later, and that well is still providing clean drinking water. That's what a good well does. It provides clean water for years, decades, sometimes even centuries to come. But when Isaiah mentions the wells of salvation, he's describing a well that will never run dry. Because Jesus Christ himself dug this well 2,000 years ago when his body was put in the ground. And to this very day, we continue to gather together here, week after week, to draw water from this well, to receive forgiveness and salvation through the word of God and through the sacraments. And the well continues to provide for us living water. The well of salvation never runs dry. In fact, we may bring our relatives, our friends, our enemies, our acquaintances, anyone with us to draw water from this well, and still the well will never run dry. The supply of living water that our Lord has provided is endless. What is our response to this wonderful providence of our Lord? What is our response to the warm welcome home of our Heavenly Father? Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Make known His deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that His name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for He has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout for joy and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. We thank our forgiving Father. We call on His name in every need. We share with others what He has done for them and for us. We give all the glory to His name alone. By the grace of God, we are home. By the grace of God, we continue to draw living water from the wells of salvation. And by the grace of God, we will live in His presence forever. Amen. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.